This week's episode of our show is sponsored by Dungeon Fog. This highly intuitive map drawing tool for tabletop role playing games is perfect for any dungeon master or world builder. We were blown away by how quickly we could create gorgeous homebrew battle maps using Dungeon Fog, from multi-level dungeons to natural environments and more. You can finish all your prep work right on the map with Dungeon Fog's really advanced annotation and note-taking features, and then you can print the map out, export a high-res image for a virtual tabletop, or even connect your computer to a projector or television and use Dungeon Fog's amazing Fog of War mode with your players at the table. Try it out free today at DungeonFog.com. A premium subscription gets you access to over 3,000 high-resolution props, textures, and assets to add more detail to your maps, with new assets added every month. Follow the links below or visit DungeonFog.com to try it out for your next game session. And now, on to this week's episode. Greetings! My name is Monty Martin. And I'm Kelly McLaughlin. And And we we are are the the Dungeon Dungeon Dudes. Dudes. Welcome to our channel where we discuss everything Dungeons & Dragons, including advice for players and guides for Dungeon Masters. We upload new videos every Thursday, so please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. This week, we are taking a look at our tips and tricks for running a published adventure module in Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. And we picked out a couple of our books from the campaigns that we've run over the years of D&D 5e. Now, pre-written modules are packed with great stories and inspiration for any DM to take upon and use at their table. However, in both of our experiences, there is still a lot of work that has to go in to running a pre-written module. Far less work than creating your own campaign setting, but still, there are some things to keep in mind. And today we're going to discuss our top tips and tricks for running pre-written modules. The pre-written modules that have been published by Wizards of the Coast for Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition and all the great third-party modules all are very inconsistent in how they are presented to Dungeon Masters. Some of these books are wonderfully organized, and the adventure basically springs itself right off the page. Some of them, though, are a real mess. And while they have awesome ideas, encounters, and storylines in them, the books themselves are really confusing for a Dungeon Master to disentangle. We've built a couple strategies that we use at our tables for making it easier for us as Dungeon Masters to economize the amount of time it takes to turn these books into a game that you can actually run at your table. So let's get rolling. All of our tips and tricks start from one core principle. You've got to read the module. This is the script for your campaign. If you're gonna write a movie, if you're gonna do a movie, if you're gonna do a television show or play, you gotta read the script, and this is basically your script that you're gonna be working from. That said, a thorough cover-to-cover reading is not always the best idea or the most efficient use of your time. I say that the best use of your time is to skim through the module, make sure that you understand each chapter, and have an understanding of the overall plot of the campaign. Before running out of the abyss, I skimmed it front to back probably 10 times just to make sure that I knew where all the pieces fell. That way, I felt confident going into running each of the missions and chapters in the game, and I read them more thoroughly as we approached each chapter. This is a great way to get the big picture of the entire adventure all at once so that you have an idea for what's going to happen in the whole campaign. Oftentimes, these books are organized so that really key details are buried in the back of the book, in the appendix, or certain characters, locations, or key plot points are not described in detail until the players encounter them. But knowing that that is coming is going to help you foreshadow certain events and is going to give you as Dungeon Master the context that you need to make the current things the players are going through make sense. So skim read the entire module. You don't need to read it thoroughly cover to cover. And then as you are running it for your players, you're going to want to reread the sections as they become relevant to your game itself. There's one main tip that I have for everybody to do as they're skimming front to back through their module that they plan to run. And that is create a roster of all the prominent NPCs, villains, monsters, 
Maybe even put in where they're located, who they are, what their aspirations and goals are. Just creating a little cheat sheet of all of the most important players in the campaign will allow you to be able to reference it easily and drop them in as needed, or at least allude to them or hint at them and their location and whereabouts. This can be very important for knowing the campaign and running it smoothly. A little bit of real talk for a moment. If you are an inspiring RPG adventure author, or if you are one of the members of the Wizard of the Coast RPG team, I love your work. But please, start including a roster in these modules. A couple of these have done it, but many of them have not. The very first thing that you open up when you look at a script for a play is the cast of characters. And this is so important for the directors, the casting director, the stage manager, and everyone, because they need to know how many people they need to cast in the play. I don't understand why published modules don't put a list at the very beginning of the module explaining who all the NPCs are, and instead leave most dungeon masters to scour through the book to figure out who the key players are. Not only that, but something that I find very important about making this roster is that when you look at the campaign modules, oftentimes prominent villains or important NPCs are not mentioned until you're entering the room that they exist in. Because of this fact, I have found that some very important characters that should have been known to the party to build up that sort of threat or presence ended up not being known to them until it was too late and they were killing them. Making a roster, I found in both the modules I've ran, has allowed me to then pepper in hints or allude to the presence of, or even have a villain taunt the party ahead of time, building them up so that the party knows who their enemies are. Unless there's a big secret about who the villain is, it is actually worth it to have the party understand who they're up against and grow that passion towards finding them and defeating them. Another way that building a roster is really useful in adapting the adventure is that you get a really clear picture of what the resources and the organizational structure of the NPCs and villains actually are. And it allows you to detach the monsters from the room that they're encountered in and possibly have them wander across the dungeon or perhaps make the villain change their plans, gather their forces together and form some sort of other attack or encounter at a different location entirely. So by building this roster, you get a really clear sense as a dungeon master what your villains and NPCs' resources actually are and you can really change the module in dramatic ways, even though you're still using the same monsters, the same NPCs, and the same locations, you're just remixing those elements and creating something original from that. As you're creating this roster of NPCs and monsters, you may also want to add to it the treasure, magic items, or any key artifacts that are really important in the campaign. In some cases, magic items that are a part of the storyline can be just as important as the NPCs and the villains themselves. So if there are these kind of major plot points, you might want to treat them as if they were an NPC in this regard. Another main point when you're getting ready to run an adventure module is to summarize the adventure. Write down what the main plot line of the adventure is without all the fiddly bits in the middle. Just what is the goal? What's the goal of the party? What's the goal of the villains? What is every major player after in this campaign setting? And by doing so, you have a quick reference to make sure that you are on track with running the story and pushing it forward in the right direction. Like the roster, this summary should fit onto a single page, even half a page if at all possible. It's a rough flowchart that tells you what the big idea, what the main conflict of the entire story is. Now, some of the adventure modules do do this quite well. Many of them, like Storm King's Thunder and Waterdeep Dragon Heist, actually have a flowchart that breaks down the overall structure and the different scenes of the adventure. I would just add to that by saying, what is the major conflict of each of these points? What is the party's major objective going to be at this point? It might be open-ended, and there might be things that change or shift around as the party gets their hands on the module. No plan that the Dungeon Master has will ever survive contact with the player characters. But giving yourself this rough idea of what the main objective is going to be, and particularly stating what the main objective of the antagonists and villains is, will help keep you in the mindset of how the moving pieces are unfolding. 
Another reason why making this summary of the entire campaign is so important is because it is exceptionally difficult to derail a campaign with a prepared and flexible dungeon master. Just because the chapter isn't going the way that you imagine because the players have come up with some zany scheme that goes an opposite direction doesn't mean that it has to throw the entire campaign off. If you're flexible and understand the key points of each chapter, you can still steer the party towards that while letting them have their zany wild schemes. As long as you're flexible and prepared, your players can go wherever they want, but you'll still be able to guide them back to where they need to be. One of my favorite ways to address this is to ask myself really seriously, what would happen if the player characters failed? What would happen if they were never involved? What would happen if the villains got their way? What steps do the villains still need to take to execute their master plan? And this way, even if the player characters are going off in a completely unrelated tangent, the plot still advances because the villains and NPCs are still taking the actions that they would take if the players were never involved. One of the most frustrating parts of running a pre-written module is that you have these wonderful, beautiful maps that really help guide the players through dungeons and you as a dungeon master to know where everything is. And then they proceed to explain each room in several pages beyond that. And I find when I'm playing at the table, I'm flipping back and forth in my book constantly, going from the explanation of the room to where it is in the map and trying to make sense of how all the pieces connect together. It is so annoying. No one has figured out the best way to organize these things, but I love how an adventure will sometimes be written and room 19 and room 20 are completely on opposite sides of the map. And it makes no sense why the rooms were numbered in this way, or they just ran out of numbers and started somewhere else, or the rooms are numbered in the most illogical pathway that the players would actually take through the dungeon. So my solution to this is to print the map out. I print it out in black and white on cheap laser printer. Um, if you are a subscriber on D&D Beyond, you can actually download high resolution versions of all the maps in the official adventure modules. And online, there are tons of other maps that have been released. Some of the map makers like Mike Schley have even released map packs that you can buy and download. So getting a printable version of the adventure maps for the fifth edition modules is really easy with a couple quick Google searches. Also keep in mind that our sponsors for the week, Dungeon Fog, are a great map making application that help you rebuild the maps for yourself or address environments that maybe aren't mapped out in the adventure books. Once you've printed out the map, now you can make adjustments and little notes next to each room in the map, which you don't really want to do in your book. Maybe you do, but I like to keep my books as clean as possible. I mean, I've seen a lot of people that do mark up their books with uh, bookmarks. They get stationary tags. They get post-it notes and stickies that they can put through the book. This is my personal preferred method because what I end up with this is a one-page summary of a location in the adventure. Currently, I'm running the notorious Chapter 4 from Out of the Abyss, which is well known to be an overly complex and convoluted chapter in that module. I'm currently doing a dungeon crawl within that chapter and have realized that several of the plots that I left out of this chapter because they weren't necessary and didn't really push the story forward for me, there's a lot of rooms in that dungeon that actually correspond to those plot lines. So being able to print out a map, cross out the rooms that have to do with things that have no relevance in the story I'm telling, and giving a more linear path not fully linear there's still a lot of player choice in yeah. there but they don't end up going down paths and spending hours exploring rooms that have no use so for me even though i put a big red x on many of these rooms that doesn't mean i'm removing them from the adventure it means that i think it's really unlikely that there's going to be a combat encounter that i'm going to want to build out on a map with a grid with miniatures and everything in that way i'm economizing where i'm spending my time in that regard because those rooms if the players go in them i'm just going to use theater of the mind for that especially with all these twisty connecty passages i'm not necessarily going to build out the entire dungeon with my Dwarven Forge stuff, I'm only going to build out the key rooms and rely on theater of the mind to transition between those locations. Lastly, as your players arrive to run through this marked up map that you've created, 
you could actually keep track of what rooms they've been in, what they've uncovered, where they ended up so that you can continue from session to session, and where they plan to go next if they have that information. This is all useful stuff that you can just write onto the map, keeping track of everything so that between sessions, you can show up the next game prepared to run the next part of that dungeon. So we've already touched on this next point a little bit, but I think we need to talk more about it. And that is skipping the boring bits. And I cannot stress enough how important this skill has been for me for running a module. So many times I read a chapter and there are a lot of great ideas in there. The main plot line is wonderful and they include their own little side missions or subplots or things that may illuminate some ideas in your head and you go, oh, I really wanna run that. But also I found in every module, there are loads of information that I just find not really necessary or things that don't interest me or wouldn't interest the players at my table. This is where the ability to cut out all the boring bits, all the parts that aren't relevant to the story you're going to tell or aren't relevant to the overall plot of the campaign, cut those out, get rid of them, and you can actually run a campaign a little bit faster without bogging it down with hours spent with the players going off in random directions. Remember, an adventure module is not a contract. You are not obligated to run it exactly the way it is printed on the page. Wizards of the Coast lawyers are not going to send a squadron of bugbears to break down your door and beat you up if you don't run it to the absolute letter. And if one of your players calls you out on changing things in the module, you can ask them how they know that. <laughs> I, I have a player who loves reading adventure modules and he has made sure that he reads chapters after I've ran them. But what's, what's actually fun about that is he comes back to me and goes, so we finished that chapter and I just read through it and wow, the way we played it at the table was a lot different. Mm -hmm. And I always say, yeah, that was the fun of it. Yeah, you should embrace that. And I will say, credit where credit is due to the authors of the adventure modules. There's a lot of filler in these things. There's a lot of words that are dedicated to things that will never be relevant or never be of interest to the player characters. Sometimes there are pages and pages and pages spent on lore and history, but the module doesn't discuss how to present that lore and history to the players in an interesting and interactive way. That's not something that you have to solve. You can just throw that out. Sometimes adventures have these happy little accidents that the specific chemistry of you, your player characters, and the adventure itself are going to yield some unexpected magic that just on your own when you're skimming through the module, you're like, this is dumb. So use your judgment with this. Um, it is important to economize the module and eject the parts of the module that aren't interesting to you, but be careful that you're not throwing out that something that your players might actually love. The counterpoint to this is don't be afraid to make the module your own by adding new things to the module itself that were just not there in the first place. My players have talked to me many times about how I like to, as they call it, fluff up each chapter. And it is something that I enjoy doing because it's me flexing my creative muscles to actually try to add an element that maybe I think will add to the story. Like we said, if you're cutting out the boring bits, it might be because you read the module and there are sections in there that add to the story, but that don't interest you. And instead, if there's something that comes into your head that does interest you, then add it in. In Rise of Tiamat, there's the enemy Rathmodar, who has a very small role, but I introduced him much earlier on in the plot and the characters became very attached to this villain. I ended up adding an entire section in where they had to go hunting for his phylactery because he was a budding lich. And so that whole plot line was something that I added in to add context to this villain and make him more interesting because my players were so responsive to him as a villain. And that chapter ended up being one of the most fun chapters in the entire campaign. And my players still talk about it to this day. One of the other great elements of this is that many of the 
official 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons modules have been expanded on by the Dungeons & Dragons Adventurers League. On the Dungeon Masters Guild, there have been one-shot style adventures and longer that have added prologues and epilogues to many of these adventures, added new side quests, NPCs, or greatly expanded locations. So if you are running one of the official 5th edition modules, it is worth checking out the Adventures League adventures that have been written for that module because they can really add a lot to the adventure. If you are setting out to run one of these pre-made modules, keep in mind as our final point that there are so many great online resources to help you out with understanding or adding to the adventure that you plan to run. Before I ran out of the abyss, I read through several other documents that people had created about their playthroughs. What worked, what didn't work, what were the struggles, what were the best parts, and what happened in their campaigns. I kind of gathered all of this information, and when I started running it, I used little bits from each one of those. Now, it still created my own story, and I find that my characters have gone in an extremely different direction than anybody else whose story I had read online. But the fun of it is, I have all of these tools in my back pocket that I can pull out from all of these online resources that I read. A few places that you can go to to get yourself started. There are great communities on Facebook and Reddit that are dedicated towards these specific 5th edition adventure modules. You can join and participate in the discussions on these groups, and they often have collected a lot of resources together in one place for dungeon masters who are running these campaigns. It also gives you a really easy place to post and say, hey, I'm having trouble with this specific part of this module, and you'll usually get a lot of great feedback from those places. Another thing is that you can scour through here on YouTube and on Twitch and other streaming and video sites to find actual play campaigns that have been run and broadcast by other Dungeons & Dragons players. On the Dungeons & Dragons YouTube channel, many of the official modules have been run by the D&D team and their other groups, so I would start there and see if you can find their campaigns, but there are many more than just this. And don't forget to check out the Dungeon Masters Guild, which we've already mentioned has a slew of resources available for most of the campaign settings, as well as just one-shot adventures and other such things that you can use to add into your own campaigns. On top of that, there's tons of blogs and campaign diaries that people have written for you to check out and get an idea on what worked and what didn't work for them. I find these extremely helpful when I'm setting out to run a new campaign. At the end of the day, the key concept here is that the pre-written adventure modules are not a Bible or a contract that you need to stick to the letter on. They're not going to be the final word. You as the DM get to have the final word on what goes in and what stays out. Use this to your advantage and the players at the table are going to tell their own story and you're going to be the dictator of how that story goes. Look at the pre-written module for inspiration, ideas, and a concept of a story that will be great to run at your own table. But make it your own and have fun with it. The more fun you're having, the more fun everybody at the table is going to have. So hopefully some of these strategies will help you economize your time so that you can run these modules more efficiently. And if saving time isn't as important as getting ideas and inspiration from these modules, hopefully some of these strategies give you a few ideas and ways that you can adapt these modules and really make them your own and make them more special than what they could ever be just on the page. It is really important to give them a good read through and skim over them. Unfortunately, very few of these modules can actually be run off the page with only a few minutes of prep time before the game session itself. So the less you have to have your nose in the book during the game session, the more you will have internalized it and the more you can really create a memorable experience at your table. So this has been a look at our top tips for running a published adventure module in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. If you have any other tips or resources you'd like to share with us, tell us about them in the comments below. If you're enjoying our show, please consider supporting our work on Patreon. You can find out how by following the links in the description below or at patreon.com slash dungeon underscore dudes. Don't forget to check out our live play Shadows of Drakenheim, which airs Tuesday nights at 6 p.m. Eastern on Twitch. You can find all the previous episodes right up over here. And we have plenty more tips and tricks for Dungeon Masters right here.
right up over here. Please subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time in, in the, the dungeon. dungeon.